Okay, question for you. What do you get when you mix Dr. Gregory House, Maya McFly, Thelma, Timon from The Lion King, that kid from Jerry Maguire, put them all in a blender, push the button, mix them together, you'd probably get a shitload of blood of guts. But if it was a magic blender that could make movies, you'd get the 1999 family adventure, Stuart Little. Yeah, this is one of those films I used to watch all the time as a kid. Loosely based on a novel by E.B. White, Stuart Little tells the story of a two-inch tall mouse who is born into a human family and goes on many pie-sized adventures. But the idea of a mouse being literally born into a human family seems a bit... weird. And to save you off from nightmares tonight, I am not going to delve into how that worked. Instead, the film chooses to have Stuart adopted. Which was a wonderful idea, as there'd be too many questions I'd have concerning what the mother did in her free time. Not gonna delve into it. Now I'm gonna give Stu a little watch again and see if it isn't just blind nostalgia that's making this film so memorable to me. But I have high hopes. It's directed by Robin Minkoff, the co-director of The Freaking Lion King, an original score from the brilliant Alan Silvestri, and it was even nominated for an Oscar. Yep, I have absolute faith that Stu a little will kick untold amounts of ass. I mean, what could possibly convince me otherwise? <laughs> Oh fuck. Wait a minute. Oh, of course, this is 1999. Back when Shyamalan could be taken seriously as a filmmaker. The Sixth Sense came out the exact same year. Ugh, after watching the live action Last Airbender movie that made me realize that there was a fifth form of bending. Shit bending. I forgot he made good movies. After all, he only wrote this one. How bad could it be? <laughs> Wait, what's this? With the exception of The Sixth Sense, a common criticism of Shyamalan's works is that they feature better direction than screenwriting. Ah, oh, sh- Everywhere I go, most everyone captures my eyes. All right, all right, there's gotta be some good here. Let's begin. The movie opens one morning in New York City, as Mr. and Mrs. Little, played by Hugh Laurie and Gina Davis respectively, are waking up. Their son George, played by Jonathan Lepnicki, comes rushing out of his room as he seems quite intense on breaking my state in the obvious counter. It's the day, it's the day! Oh. It's the day, it's the day, it's the day! It's always today, George. I mean, this is the day. That's right. <laughs> Wait a minute. We just cut from getting out of bed to arriving at the school bus. Did Mrs. Little really wait all this time to reply? Or was George here literally shouting, it's today, it's today, all whilst he got ready for school? Good God, I hope it wasn't the latter. It's today, 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 it's always today, George, but this is the day. It's today, it's today. Well. Lucky I bought some of that hydrochloric stuff from Walter. So it turns out the Little family are planning to adopt a second child. So as George heads to school, Mr. and Mrs. Little visit the orphanage. I should say that orphanages now no longer exist in the US, but if I point out every implausibility in this movie, then I reckon by the time I'm finished we'll be seeing the release of Half-Life 3. Oh, Frederick, look at them. How could we possibly shoes? I know. They all seem so wonderful. You know what's wonderful? What's wonderful is how you both know what the other one is gonna say before you even say it. <laughs> Not that it's any of my business. Yes, well, that happens when you've been together as long. Whoa, 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 whoa. I think a more sane reaction in this situation would be ah, fucking talking mouse. So yes, yeah, well, an happens. anthropomorphic talking rodent doesn't seem to phase Mr. and Mrs. Little. Uh, 
Apparently this film must take place in some sort of strange alternate reality where mice are a sort of second intelligent being. A sort of second species that can classify themselves as American citizens. Can't say I've ever seen a world like that before. Well regardless, we're introduced to our titular character, Stuart, voiced by Martin McFly himself, Michael J. Fox. And, as it turns out, Stuart's quite knowledgeable about the plays as he knows his fellow orphans well. So, Stuart, what choices do the Littles have here? You know, if you want a girl, Susan can read French. Whoa, a girl can read French? Wow, what can the others do? And Edith over there can tap dance while blowing bubbles. There's, um, variation in the intelligence of the kids here, isn't there? But a tap dancing, bubble blowing prodigy doesn't interest Mr. and Mrs. Little, as they find that Stuart is the one they want to adopt. Are you quite certain you're prepared to handle his uniqueness? Oh my, yes. Yes, you see, we're Mormons too. Mr. and Mrs. Little, we try to discourage couples from adopting children outside their own species. It rarely works out. I hear you, Mrs. Keeper, which is why we're going to put out a life insurance policy on him. My son will live for a couple of years anyway, so this doesn't look like quite the profitable venture. Yes. So as our opening credits roll, we see Mr. and Mrs. Little's adoption papers go through, and on seemingly the very same day, take Stuart home. Huh. Well, I would say that this is most likely not how the American adoption process works, but then I remember that this is a universe where you can adopt a mouse as your son and not get committed in the process, so questioning this would be kind of stupid. Well, Stuart, here we are, the family home. They say every little in the world can find this house, even if they've never been here before. It's just something inside them. Yeah, that and quick access to a phone book helps too. So Stuart makes himself home as Mr. and Mrs. Little introduces him to the rest of the family. And that's George, your brother. Look, he's already happy to see me. Well, that's just about everybody, except for... Ah! Oh! Whoa, Snowbell! Whoa, 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 whoa. Let me get this straight. So, you two knowingly adopted a mouse as your son when you own a pet cat. Isn't that as stupid as adopting a mouse when you have a pet cat? Oh. I I'm so sorry. What you just did then was so unbelievably stupid that the dumbest comparative situation I wanted to use to describe how dumb this is is exactly what you just did! I'm surrounded by idiots. Okay, so... Bar that IQ degrading level of stupidity, Mr. and Mrs. Little attempt to tell Snowbell to spit him out. Whoa. Snowbell! Drop him right now! You spit Stuart out this instant, Snowbell! Spit him right out! Yes, eating family members is bad, Snowbell. Spit him right now! <laughs> well. Okay. I'll go get the scalpel. Okay, actually it turns out Snowbell is officially the world's most obedient cat as he spits Stuart out. George then arrives home as Mr. and Mrs. Little now have to tell their firstborn that they got a mouse to be his brother. Stuart, this is George. George, this is Stuart, your new brother. No, really. Really, George, this is your new brother. Mom, Dad, have you been on the Quaaludes again? So, yeah, George isn't exactly enamoured with the current situation as things don't look much better at dinner time. Shall we get to know each other a little? George, don't you have anything you want to ask Stuart? Sure, George. Go ahead. I'm an open book. Ask me anything. The first thing that pops into your head. Could you pass the gravy? You know, I would have had so many questions going through my head here. Go ahead. I'm an open book. Ask me anything, the first thing that pops into your head. Okay, uh, are you aware that mice are considered a delicacy in parts of the world? If I accidentally stepped on you one day and crushed you to death, uh, would that count as manslaughter? Could you say, that's heavy, Doc, for me? Speaking of which, why do you sound like a man in his thirties? As a relatively intelligent being, do you wipe? How the hell are you reaching the table?
So after dinner, Stuart heads to bed, but he unfortunately gets an unwelcome midnight visitor. Are you cozy? Yes, thanks. I'm quite comfortable. Because all I've got to sleep on is a rag in the corner, you little rat. Oh, don't be a snowbell. Cats can make even the most bizarre of locations feel like the Ritz. Sorry, I'm a little confused. I said that's what you do with a pet. A pet? I am not your pet. I'm a cat. You're a mouse. You should be living in a hole. This is my family. Can't we share them? Read my furry pink lips. No. Speaking of furry pink lips... Silence! <laughs> You know what, I think Snape is right on this one. So when Snowball voices his displeasure that his new master is a mouse, uh, honestly, who can blame him, the family wake up the next morning as Stuart and George brush their teeth. Yeah, you heard that right. There's an entire scene dedicated to them brushing their teeth. But watch it. You see, this is an example of a scene which would be nothing without the music. I mean, it's just the two of them keeping their gnashes on nice and clean, yet the score really kicks this up a notch. God, I should employ Alan Silvestri to write up my life. <laughs> George, I'm trying to get the laundry started. Okay. So Mrs. Little gets the laundry started, but due to some rather unfortunate circumstances, Stuart ends up locked in the washer. Can you believe this? I'm locked in the washer. Can you help me? Can you turn this thing off? Why would I turn it off? It's my favorite show. Snowbell, Snowbell, you can't leave me! Good God, he's leaving Stuart to die? Again, listen to the score. This funky sax music is totally distracting me from how sadistic this scene is. He's leaving him a drowner death. <laughs> Seriously, watch this scene with different music and tell me this isn't fucked up. Why would I turn it off? It's my favorite show. Snowbell, Snowbell, you can't leave me! for all the family. <laughs> well, Mrs. Little finally realizes what she's done and she pulls Stuart out of the washer. <laughs> now, that's an image you don't want on the DVD case. So it turns out Stuart survives this sudden brush with death as the next day the family decide to go shopping. Mrs. Little and Stuart head into a store to pick out an outfit with the help of a, uh, I'll be honest, kind of creepy stock look. Here we have Barbados Ben. Chef Ben. Lumberjack Ben. Hmm. And of course, Gladiator Ben. We also have Dominatrix Ben. That model comes with many additional accessories. Does Ben always dress like this? No, 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 madam. There are many moods of Ben, and it all depends on the occasion. For example, we also have Nudist Ben. His outfit were given away for free. So Stuart picks out an outfit as later that day, members of the extended family arrive to greet Stuart. And despite the initial shock over the whole mouse thing, the group are quickly won over and seem very happy with Stuart. But perhaps a little too happy. Climb on up here, son. Plant your caboose right up here. He may have to grow into it. I think he's grown a little since we've been here. What? That's what happened to me. One summer, I just shut right up. Okay, it's happened again. The movie is high. He may have to grow into it. I think he's grown a little since we've been here. That's what happened to me. One summer, I just shut right up. Yeah, yeah, like, one day right. Totally grew six feet in an hour, swear God. May, may I say something? In the orphanage, we used to tell fairy tales of finding our families and, and having a party like this. 
party with cakes and presents and, and all varieties of meatloaf. Don't forget the wacky backy. So I, I just wanted to thank each of you because now I know fairy tales are real. Fairy tales are real? real. I, I, huh? I think I'm gonna cough up a fur bowl. <laughs> is it weird that the character I identify most within this movie is the cat? But Crenshaw has one extra special gift for Stuart and George. Something passed down from many generations. This ball belonged to your great, great grandfather, Jedediah Little. He had it surgically removed prior to his death. Remember Frederick, those long summer days playing catch? Ah, those were the days. Remember when we used Jedediah's small intestines as a skipping rope? Longest skipping rope we ever had. But the get-together is sadly ruined by Adolf George here as he shuns Stuart as a mouse and nothing more. The family all leave, I guess the word discipline isn't to be found in their vocabulary set, as the night arrives when we get to uh, this scene. And just to get the point across of how weird this scene is, I'm gonna add this filter. Okay, he's alive, but that would have explained that rather scary reaction. What's the matter? I I just wanted to ask you something, but you're already asleep. So I decided to crawl into the bed and creep you the fuck out. It's what any sane being would do. What did you want to ask us? About my real family. You know, the ones I look like. So Stuart's curious about his real parents, so Mr. and Mrs. Little visit the orphanage the next day in hopes of getting some answers. After all, Check out the horrifying emotional truth. You have an empty space. That's so sad. <laughs> Are there problems with Stuart? Problem? No. No, no, not at all. There's, well, there's been a few difficulties. Difficulties? difficulties. Well, like the cat trying to eat him when we first brought him home. <laughs> yeah, just one cat of attempted murder. Nothing to worry about. Oh yeah, there was also that time where he nearly drowned to death, but two near-death experiences in 24 hours? That's nothing to fret about, no. Yeah. So meanwhile, back at an unsupervised little house, Stuart asks Snowbell if they can start over and be friends. Snowbell's answer? Um... You know, that's how I respond now whenever someone suggests something stupid to me. Hey, suspect, do you want to go see the new Transformers film? Um, no. Oh, I, I use the gun for those especially stupid suggestions. So yeah, Snowbell's still grouchy, but his day's about to get a whole lot worse as a visitor arrives, an alley cat named Monty, voiced by Steve Zahn. Go away, there's no food here. Please. Shoo! Oh, now who could say no to that face? I'm desperate. I'm begging you. From a mother to a mother, please. Please. Oh, Ed. Please. Oh, all right. So Monty comes in uninvited as Snowball tries his best to get him to leave, otherwise he risks Monty telling all the other cats in the neighborhood that his new master is a mouse. Hey Snow, what's wrong with you? Nothing. You know, you're the one acting strange. What is it, worms, fleas? Yeah, you look pale. Eww. Maybe you should see a vet. A vet? What a swell idea. Do you know anybody? I'm not so happy with mine. He makes us wait and his hands are always cold. Did you just seriously ask a stray cat if he knows a good vet? Is that like asking Vin Diesel if he knows a good hairdresser? But upon leaving, Monty notices Stuart and, uh, wait a minute. Oh no. How did Stuart get up there? I mean, we saw him carrying around this box that's twice as big as him and yet he somehow got himself in this relatively heavy box onto the kitchen counter. That'd be like me carrying this sofa on top of my house. Unless Stuart has some sort of super ability or honed skill we're not aware of. Wait a minute. Oh my god. 
white fur, can drive a car, goes on many adventures. Stu a little is a young danger mouse. What a twist! So Monty finds out Snowbell is now Stuart's pet as he starts pissing himself <laughs> laughing. And poor old Snowbell just can't take the humiliation so he chases Stuart throughout the house. <laughs> you know, I have to admit, it's uh, quite depressing that this scene alone makes a better Tom and Jerry movie than the actual Tom and Jerry movie. So Stuart hides out in the basement and runs into George who gets the kick-ass basement any kid could ever hope for. Holy shit! Is, is that a train? What's it look like, Picklehead? Can we play with it? Please, 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 please! Please! Good God, George tied up Stuart on the tracks! Please, somebody help me! <laughs> All right, okay, George isn't that psycho. In fact, this little jackass with the spider stunt actually impresses him, as he shows Stuart his model roadster. Though I have to admit, if this was a model DeLorean, that would have been fucking awesome. But anyway, George then shows Stuart a model boat he's been building for a big boat race taking place in Central Park. What's that? That's a wasp. I call it that because it's small, irritating, and annoying as fuck. Should have called it the beaver, actually. When are you gonna finish it? Well, me and my dad were building it. But I decided to stop. How come? I'm too little for a race like that. Little? You're not little. <laughs> yeah, look, Nikki. Just look at what you're gonna look like in 10 years' time. Jesus! And to think, but Nikki's only one year older than I am. I'm just going to do the rest of the review like this, don't mind me. So Stuart convinces George to get to work on the wasp as they get it ready for the big race. In the meantime, Monty introduces Snowbell to an alley cat called Smokey, who can apparently, um... Make Stuart enough where he can't refuse. What is it now? Well, my friend Snowbell here needs a favor. Snowbell? <laughs> now there's a manly name. Hey, that don't mean Jack. Case in point, let me introduce you to... Ashley. Swallow this. You know, I'm feeling less and less like a man by the minute. <clears throat> Continue. So the day of the boat race arrives as Stuart and George prepare their vessel. But it looks like they have a bit of competition. Piloted by Anton Gartrand. Oh no, Anton! Gee, George, what did you do? Get that out of a cereal box? <laughs> hey! <laughs> Real funny, Fonzie. Ass. So George isn't exactly hopeful, so Frederick gives him a pep talk in this, um, very strange scene. Are you okay? Maybe we should go home. Why? I'm not wearing my lucky underwear. You don't have lucky underwear. Well, maybe we should get some and then come back for another race. Um, what the hell was that? Was that supposed to be funny? Because, well, it didn't make any sense. I mean, what are the race? And since when does someone forget that they don't have lucky underwear? What a strange piece of dialogue. Who the hell wrote this? M. Night? Oh, yeah. But you want to hear something even stupider? Guess who they got to get the remote? Where's Stuart? Stuart, what happened? It was completely my fault. I, I couldn't grip it. You know, Stuart, I'd be more grateful a more likely situation didn't occur. Ah! Look out, sir! Oh. You know, Mrs. Little, I hear some Koreans use dead mice to ferment their wines. I got a nice Chardonnay brewing back home. What do you say? So, yeah, the remote breaks is everyone is devastated. Everything will be all right. No, well, maybe we could fix it, huh? A little glue? Who knows? 
Mom, there's only one way glue will fix this situation. <laughs> oh, that's just wonderful. <laughs> oh my god, a talking mouse! <laughs> so the race begins without them and it's looking like all is lost until something quite implausible happens. The sails are full and there's a mouse on the boat. <laughs> what are you doing? Sailing! Oh! Gee, George, it sure is a good thing we scrapped the idea of building a remote controlled boat and actually built a real fucking boat. MIT should be sucking our dicks. So, yeah, apparently George and Stuart built a real scale down to size boat, rudder, mainsail, helm, everything. Oh, and how long did it take them to build it? Two days. Two days? A fucking ten-year-old built a real fucking boat in two days? What do you know? Haven't you heard of suspension of disbelief? Well, I have heard of it. I just need a little bit of help every now and again. <laughs> oh, Shyamalan is a genius. So the race gets underway. Stuart does rather well and makes his way to second place. But Anton here decides to dabble in a little bit of, um, well, there's no way of putting this, attempted murder. Hope that mouse can swing. How is nobody ripping off the remote out of his hands and putting the little shit in a correctional facility? I mean, Jesus! Hey, hey, hey! George, stop being so impolite. Let the nice boy murder your brother in peace. But Anton's ship malfunctions as Stuart pulls himself away and crosses the finishing line in first place. And they go nuts! Yeah! Yeah, bitch! Yeah! So the family head home to party, but unfortunately their celebration is uh, rather short lived. Mr. Lump? Yes? Down here. Very sorry to disturb you at your lovely abode. I hope we're not intruding. How did they reach the doorbell? <laughs> I'll kill myself. So yeah, we're introduced to Reggie and Camille who surprise surprise share their relation with Stuart. We're his parents! <laughs> So the two mice are brought in as they convince Mr. and Mrs. Little to give Stuart to them. And they do! Yep, two random strangers knocked on their door, claimed they were Stuart's parents with no proof, and end up taking him without even signing a custody form. This movie is on crack. So, something about this is not right, I just know it. Look at them. They just fit. They just fit? Literally, the only reason you're saying that is because they're rodents. I need I say that the population of mice and rats in New York City rivals that of humans. Ugh. But then again, maybe this is for the best. How many near-death experiences has Stuart had in this movie so far? <coughs> yeah, um, Mr. and Mrs. Little, you're awful parents, and you just outright giving your son away to two complete random strangers is the latest of your crimes. This movie should have been over by now. If you had half a brain, then the previous scene should have gone like this. <laughs> Where are his parents? Got any proof? Uh, no. Movie's over, people. Be sure to take your trash with you and leave the theatre in an orderly fashion. So yeah, Stu is taken away as the morning arrives at a grief-stricken little house. Oh, poor woman. Her favourite jumper shrank in the wash. Now that's just horrible. So Mrs. Keeper pops around. Three days after Stuart's departure, I'll uh, get to why I think this is unbelievably stupid in a minute, as she was able to find out what happened to Stuart's real parents. Ah, uh, 
They had an accident. With who? Stuart's parents. Yeah, but don't tell Stuart. He's been told his parents actually wanted him. How was Stuart taking it? Well, he doesn't know. Well, six months after they don't come back from shopping, isn't he gonna wonder where they went? But they've been gone for years. Years? How is that possible? <laughs> okay, Jeannie, you're not in a corny Japanese video game or something. Turn down the acting a bit, would you? Years? How is that possible? Because they died years ago. Which part is confusing you? Stuart's parents came and took him away three days ago. Three days ago? Stuart's parents whoa, died whoa, in whoa, 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 whoa. I think the same reaction to that news would go as such. Stuart's parents came and took him away three days ago. Whoa, 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 wait. Are you meaning to say that you gave Stuart away to two complete random strangers and you didn't even notify me? You didn't even ask for evidence that they were his real parents? No signing of custody forms or inquiring about a DNA test, perhaps? Your son has been kidnapped, you know. Dear, we have to take this up with the police. Yeah, and call social services too, because you two are clearly not fit to be parents. Man, a lobotomized Miss America pageant would have more common sense than this. Oh. So as it turns out, Smokey ordered Reggie and Camille to pose as to its parents in order to get Stuart to leave the little house. So Smokey decides to stop wasting time and put Stuart on tonight's menu as the main course. And after okay. Mr. and Mrs. Little call the police to see if they can find Stuart... It's my guess these two sickos are on some kind of cross-country mouse-killing spree. Uh. It's my guess these two sickos are on some kind of cross-country mouse-killing spree. They're of no use. We cut back to Stuart as Camille can't keep up the charade anymore and orders Reggie to tell the truth. So you agreed to pose as my parents? Yes. You lied and cheated? Yes. You took me away from the Littles, just when we were all so happy. Yes. That's wonderful. <laughs> Stuart, they took away what makes you happiest. Man, if someone took away my happiness like that, I wouldn't be so forgiving. You told Jade and Smith he could act? Yes. You cancelled Flash Forward after a season one cliffhanger? Yes! You made it so that all YouTubers had to use Google Plus? Yes! You bastards! <laughs> so Reggie tells Stuart of the cats that are now looking for him, as Stuart decides his first course of action is to get back to the little house. Every little in the world can find the little house! Wait a minute, he's driving there? Why don't you just catch a fucking cab? We saw Reggie trying to hail one down earlier, so we know they could go down that option. How else did you think Reggie and Camille got to the little house in the first place? Besides, check out what Reggie just said to Stuart. Oh, hello, oh, oh, that's miles from here, and it's dark out, and every cat in the city is looking for it. Which you wouldn't have to give two shits about if you just took a taxi. Well, as it turns out, Qui Gon Jin was right. The ability to speak definitely does not make you intelligent. You morons. So as Stuart races home, George hatches a plan to put Missing Persons posters out in the city to help look for Stuart. Missing Persons posters with no picture, no contact information, and no mention of what the reward is for finding Stuart. But we'll cut back to Stuart, who's had an unfortunate running with Smokey and the Bandits here, as they partake in a, I have to admit, pretty awesome chase scene. Hell, the only thing that could have made this scene better is, as I said before, if Stuart was driving a DeLorean. Could have led to quite the escape. Great Scott. But in actual reality, Stuart falls into the sewers, and needless to say, the cats don't want to follow. Stuart manages to save himself, though the roadster is a goner. Crenshaw, Tina, Uncle Stretch. Wait a minute, Uncle Stretch? What, couldn't you get Cousin Stinky and Aunt Fatso help you in a search too? So Stuart arrives at the little house right after they left, 
and is greeted by Snowbell, who manages to successfully trick Stuart into believing the Luttle family now hate him. And what reasons does Stuart have for believing anything that Snowbell has to say? None whatsoever. Weird. They did that right after you left. Mrs. Little said, who wants to look at that face anymore? She did? Yeah. And George? She gave it to him and he tore it up. Yeah, and then George took a pen and wrote the word gullible on his forehead. He did. Yeah. So yeah, Stuart's an idiot as he leaves for Central Park, but Smokey and his pals still want a piece of that mouse. Hey Snow! One of the guys spotted Stuart in the park. Smokey sent me to get you. Ah, uh, gee, Monty, uh, I'm in for the night. It's late. Besides, Stuart is gone. Can't we just give the kid a break? Of course we could give him a break. First we'll break his little arms, then we'll break his little legs, and then we'll take a break. <laughs> but to be fair, the word break can be horribly misinterpreted. For example, in Rocky IV when Ivan Drago said his infamous line, he wasn't talking in Rocky. I must break you. Ow. So Snowball and Monty join up with the rest of the cast as they head into Central Park. Snowball manages to find Stuart, but unfortunately the rest of the cats are too far behind. Snowball then has a change of heart and reveals to Stuart that the Littles do like him. Um, might quick turn around there, Snowball? Come on, Smokey. Can't we talk it over? You know, Stuart's not so bad once you get to know him. And he's got his own car. Uh, not anymore, he doesn't. The roadster's probably now sailing down a stream of human byproducts. Oh yeah, speaking of which, we never saw Stuart clean himself. Damn, he quite literally swam in raw sewage. How is nobody bringing up the stench that is most likely emanating from Stuart right now? What's that smell? Oh, that would be me. I've been swimming in raw sewage. I love it. I love it! So Stuart attempts an escape, but is quickly cornered on a branch. But Snowbell saves Stuart by... breaking the branch all the cats are on. Bloody hell! Have the Littles been slipping Snowbell a protein supplement in his food or something? Well anyway, Snowbell clearly has more brawn than brain as he forgot old Smokey here. Say goodnight, Tinkerbell. His name is Snowbell, bitch. Oh, this water's damn cold. Well, I guess you could say that that is one wet silence. I deserve that. So Smokey is defeated as Stuart and Snowbell head home as George just narrowly catches sight of Stuart. <laughs> Well, if Stuart had to wait outside for the whole night, then that ending would have been a bit anticlimactic. I miss you all oh, so much. I thought I'd never see you again. I, I don't understand. How did you manage it? Every little in the world can find the little house. <laughs> yeah, and he means every little. Just look who Eleanor had to turn away this morning. Good morning, ma'am. And isn't it a lovely morning? So Stuart reveals Snowbell helped him get back. The Littles never question how he helped, so I'm left wondering why Snowbell never reveals his ability to speak, but Stuart does, as the family head inside and the credits roll. All whilst quite possibly the best live action Tom and Jerry skit you'll ever see plays us out. <laughs> So that's Stuart Little. How does it hold up? Well, I think this is one of those films where a lot of its appeal stems from nostalgia. I used to watch this movie all the time as a kid, and when I watch these memorable scenes and hear the iconic score again, my childhood just rushes right back to me. So how would new audiences find it? I just think they'd find it good. It's not laugh out loud hilarious, and a lot of the dialogue is just odd, but the film definitely has an undeniable charm to it. Easily the best thing about this film is the music. Now, it most definitely gets overly whimsical at times, but Alan Silvestri's score is wonderful regardless. This film would be nothing without it, as it just brings Stuart Little to life. To illustrate this, compare a scene which has no music. Mmm. Meatloaf is delicious, dear. Cajun to one that does. Oh, 
This music just makes these small scale events feel so grandiose. The Central Park race, for example, is just remote controlled boats going in a straight line, but the score takes it to another level. Not to mention the brilliant direction of Rob Minkoff, who frames these shots in a way to accentuate how small Stuart is, without taking away any sense of urgency and adventure these comparatively tiny events have. The performances are also great. Michael J. Fox is brilliant as Stuart. Some may say it's a bit weird that a man in his late 30s voiced a character who presumably is around the age of 10, but I think it works. Fox gives Stuart an unbelievable amount of heart and pep. It's hard to comment on this really, the voice and the character design just seem to match perfectly. The rest of the cast are great too. Nathan Lane brings so much personality to Snowbell, Steve Zahn as Monty just cracks me up, and the live action cast all do a fine job with their roles, even if some of them get a little over melodramatic at times. But I gotta give them credit as to how they were able to keep straight faces considering what they had to say. But he has an empty space. <clears throat> Sorry. But I've gotta give Laurie Davis and Lip Nicky major props for making Stuart feel so part of this world. Remember, as actors, they're talking to thin air when they speak to Stuart. They'll have felt like idiots at times. You'll understand what I mean when you see what Gina Davis had to do when Mrs. Little kisses Stuart. <laughs> All part of the job, I guess. Now, at the start of the review, I mentioned that Stuart Little got nominated for an Oscar. Now, how this wasn't for Best Original Score, I don't know. It was instead for Best Visual Effects. Now, considering that this film came out in 99, the CGI for Stuart holds up surprisingly well. I don't think he would look that much better if he was made using today's technology. Hell, there's CGI characters in films made today that look far worse than Stuart, so the Oscar nomination is well deserved. It didn't stand the chance at winning though, considering the other two films it was up against. Now, this year's nominees took us on a trip through the matrix of time, on a trip through the galaxy far, far away, and on a trip to Central Park with a little mouse named Stuart. Am I the only one in there wants to see Arnold in a Stuart Little movie? God, that'd be awesome. But anyway, it's nice that the Academy gave this film a little love. After all, the CGI is used sparingly. The cats used here are real cats, and I'm super impressed with how they were able to train them to do the things they do. Dogs, of course, are much easier to train, but I reckon cats would be a bitch to work with. So props to the trainers here. The scene where Monty's gang chase after Stuart is phenomenally well done. I have no idea how they got the cats to do what they did in this scene. Now one major complaint this film gets is how unbelievable it is. How can a mouse go about his routine without getting squished by a heavy foot of a human? How can miniatures of boats and cars be controlled as if they had fully fledged engines and work it in a part? How can two mice show up to your door? claim their parents of your child and end up taking him without even signing a custody form. A lot of stuff in this movie doesn't make any lick of sense, which is why you need to go into it with as much suspension of disbelief as possible. Because if you don't, you'll hate this film. It's a kid's movie, so try not to think dark thoughts whilst watching it. I know that's what I've been doing for the past 40 minutes, but that's besides the point. Just try your best to enjoy the charm of the film and its characters. It's a fun ride, and in my opinion, it's great for the kids. I wouldn't call it a classic, but I think it's close to one. If you have kids, I don't see why they wouldn't enjoy it. Put your feet up, give it a watch, and see for yourself. And if you want more, Stuart, check out the worthy follow-up. It's a blast, and arguably even better. It's got James Woods as a falcon. If that doesn't sell it to you, I don't know what will. I'm the unusual suspect. Stay tuned as there's more reviews coming your way. Hey, uh, Alan, can I have a cue for my exit, please? Thank you.